There, yeah. Oh, no. but it's backwards. It's okay. <laughs> you can give the talk. <laughs> there we go. All right. We made it. Thanks for staying. Uh, so, so thanks. Um, yeah, so um, I think this paper is probably most closely aligned with the first paper because that one was about production in my mind of 360 videos, sort of. Uh, and this one's really about consuming 360 videos. So as, as Frank kindly mentioned, um, we have these 360 videos that capture kind of environments around us and really thinking about you know, how we, we should go about designing 360 video players. And I would argue that most of the 360 video experiences that we have are single user experiences. Um, so, you know, these kinds of experiences that many of us would probably never really get an opportunity to partake in or not really have the guts to do it, right? So this is obviously a ski jumping experience. And, you know, this video is warped in such a way that it can fit into this, this, this aspect ratio. <clears throat> the typical video player has you, um, you know, viewing it in such a way that you can use the, the gyroscope on your phone to kind of like look around the environment or you can, you know, drag around with your finger to look around. <clears throat> and so what we're thinking about here is we're trying to imagine what it looks like when we're going to be experiencing these videos and watching these videos with somebody else. And the kinds of experiences we had been thinking about were um, instances where somebody had gone on a trip somewhere and they'd recorded a video and they were trying now to explain it or show that video to someone else. And if you think about what this looks like, um, this can be an awkward experience. So if you imagine here that Salmi is on the left and Kirk is um, watching the video with Salmia. Salmia perhaps has gone to Paris and she's showing him something. Um, this is great for her, but the problem is for Kirk, <laughs> it can be challenging to see what she's showing, right? In the same way, on the right side here, <clears throat> perhaps Kirk wants to, he noticed something in the video that he wants to look at, but Salmi is trying to, you know, narrate that experience and she wants to have control of this. And so we see these kind of like inherent challenges when people are trying to watch these 360 videos uh, on a single uh, player. So the message here is going to be that essentially if we're going to start thinking about uh, building these 360 video players for multiple users, uh, we need to carefully understand what it is that they're going to be doing independently, together, jointly, and think about transitions between these activities. So I'll kind of um, pointed that one of the things that we thought about immediately was like, okay, let's get rid of this idea of having, um, e like sharing, a, sharing a, a video player. Maybe each one of them can sort of watch it sort of independently and sort of what happens in that situation. So what I'm going to be talking about today is really just kind of the study that we used to kind of understand what that experience was like. And just to set the scene a little bit, what we did was we recorded um, a video of, and this is Omid, who's kind of going around campus. So he's driving around campus, he's got a 360 camera on a backpack, and he's just trying to, you know, take somebody on kind of this, this walking tour, essentially, of, of campus. Okay, so we used this pre-recorded video, and we recorded this. And, what we, and the setup that the participants found themselves in were, was kind of sitting in our lab. And so here you can see these two different participants. And they're each holding their own iPad that's going to be time synced in this video, but they're effectively disconnected. So I can look around independently of my buddy, right? So the question that we were interested in here is, what kinds of challenges do they encounter when they're kind of um, watching videos this way? And what kinds of workarounds do they apply to kind of address these issues? Um, as I mentioned, there was a pre-recorded bike tour. And these two different people had different roles. So we recruited them in such a way that there was somebody that actually knew campus. Usually these were students or alumni. And so that person acted as a tour guide. And then there was a new student, like somebody that was going to play the role of the new student. And these people did not know campus well. So usually it was a, it was a family member or a friend that didn't go to, uh, to, go to our school. Um, and the task, of course, was that the tour guide was going to be providing this tour uh, to this new student. So they were kind of like play acting, essentially. Um, 32 different participants, 16 different pairs. So the, the principal challenge that they encountered, of course, when they're kind of watching videos and slightly, you know, time synced, but sort of independently of one another, is essentially one person sort of looking over here, and they may ask a question or point out something about something that they're looking over here at over here, and the other person is not sure what they're looking at. That's the principal challenge, like, problem that they ran into. And so really what I'm going to talk about today is some of the sort of workarounds that they applied. Um, so synchronized viewing is kind of something that we didn't observe very often, but it was really, really funny when it happened. So in this situation, um, what you have here is that the fellow on the left here, he's the tour guide. Uh, the woman on the right is the, is the student. And what you're going to see is they're going to sort of synchronize their movements in a really sort of um, 
uh, in my mind, sort of a humorous sort of way. And so what she's doing is she's keeping, you know, peripheral vision, like using peripheral vision to keep track of what it is that he's doing, and she's mimicking, mimicking him um, almost to a T, right? So all those micro movements, she's doing exactly what she's doing. Um, so this didn't happen very often, but when it did, it was awesome because it was sort of funny, uh, particularly when the video was played back as here in eight times speed or four times speed. Uh, what we saw more frequently was that uh, essentially um, different partners had different needs. They wanted to look at different kinds of things. And the, the most obvious way that this happens is that the tour guides typically are following the direction of the video. So the, the way in which the, uh, the cyclist is traveling, uh, the tour guide follows that. Whereas the new student is typically kind of like panning around and looking around like crazy. So I'll let you try to guess which one was the new student in here and which one was the tour guide. Whoops. And if you, in fact, guessed that the fellow on the right is the new student, you were right. And so we'll, we'll try a different pair, basically. And so these are kind of really interesting observations because you see these, like, and they're so obvious. Um, so here, um, the, the tour guide is on the right and the new student's on the left. And you can see she's you know, really trying to check out the place. Here again, tour guide on the right and the new student is on the left, right? So new students or people that are unfamiliar with the environment want to kind of look around. If you think about, you know, having given, if you've ever given a tour of a space, I mean, you know what's coming, so it's not that surprising. Uh, the last thing I'll point out real quick is that um, uh, uh, they would look at each other's screens at times, point at each other's screens, you know, even drag um, things on each other's screens. So I think in this case, what you end up seeing is that to, the the, the tour guide on the right ends up kind of panning the, the new student's uh, screen around on the left. We see that happen again uh, multiple times. I think this is kind of a final workaround when you know, they clearly uh, are having a difficult time understanding what each other's looking at. Here again, the, the, the uh, tour guide is on the right and she's kind of manipulating the fellow's screen there. Okay, so this is kind of fine. What do we do with all this stuff? Um, the, in the, I'll encourage you to take a peek at the paper for some ideas that we have for uh, different kinds of designs. Uh, I think one of the kind of obvious ones, if you think about that uh, top little thing as being sort of a panorama to represent a 360 view, is to provide sort of gaze awareness. So here if we have Lisa and she's on the left and she's looking at that uh, yellow viewport, and here's Frank and he's on the right and he's looking at that green viewport, that it would be useful if there were sort of colored, perhaps colored, I don't know, um, indicators essentially indicating where the other person was looking. Um, so that's gaze awareness. I think the other interesting idea to think about is perhaps there are mechanisms that we can use to allow people to sort of flexibly engage or disengage with one another's views, right? So if I'm frank and I'm like, hey, what is it that you're looking at? Maybe I press a button. And the interface essentially is some PowerPoint magic for you right there. Um, sort of magic. You want to see it again? I'll do it again. It's like took a half hour to make, so you know. <laughs> Um, anyway, so it pans over and, and, and the indicator goes away because now they're looking at the same thing, all that stuff. So that's sort of a flexible engagement mechanism, right? And you can easily imagine that it goes in the reverse direction too. So this took only 10 minutes to make, so. Ooh, okay. Um, I don't know. So I, I think there are a whole bunch of different kinds of ideas like that. And uh, eight minutes is not a lot of time to give a talk, so I'll leave you with that, uh, that thought, which is that when we think about designing these 360 video experiences for multiple people, we need to think about what it is that they're doing and whether we can kind of allow them to engage and disengage with one another. Thanks. <laughs> Too awesome. Hi, uh, Kent Lyons, Technicolor. I wonder if you could talk about the, the third uh, finding that you didn't, you know, kind of address in a design implication. I mean, this this notion of people looking around when they don't know the environment yeah. and not looking around when they know it, and you can see that in all sorts of different types of content. In fact, you know, it, very easy to induce motion sickness because you're looking around too much, right? Um, and so I'm wondering if you had any ideas, kind of from the study, that might fall out for maybe helping some of those problems. Uh, helping the problem of motion sickness? Well, no. Helping look around less or kind of me mediating that a little bit more? Um, that's a really good question. I actually don't have any ideas at all. <laughs> but maybe we could talk a little later. Uh, hi, Shalma at Cornell Tech. I wonder if you have uh, thought about if people are viewing 360 videos in uh, headsets, 
how that experience would create challenges for people who are viewing together and whether some of the findings or design implications from your study would yeah. sort of go I, with that. Really good question. I mean, I think here, you know, clearly we use these little iPads essentially. And I think that one of the things that you get sort of for free when you're using the, these iPads is that you can see your peers to some extent. Um, and so the idea is if I have these head mounted displays, like, do I? Yeah, you, you know, you lose that, right? And so I think um, in those types of situations, yeah, now we're gonna have to really rely on some of these sort of virtual indicators if, if we wanna maintain an awareness of other people. I mean, I think that um, even in sort of co-located situations where we're all using tablets, I mean, we were starting to think a little bit about what it would look like in a classroom scenario where the teacher is, let's say, taking us on a tour of the Louvre, right? And so even in that co-located scenario, even if we're all using on these iPads, I mean, you know, I can't track all these kids and what they're doing, right? And so it's sort of fascinating to think about what gaze awareness mechanisms look like in these larger group scenarios. I mean, here we've got two people, so it's a little bit easier to kind of like take a peek at, um, but I think it can easily, you know, not scale properly <laughs> the way we've got it here. Yeah. Well, if there are no further questions, um, let's thank all the speakers in the session. <laughs>